So Park City Republican women are trying to move forward with doing some meetings, although not in person. We're doing interviews with candidates we all care about. And today I have the great pleasure of having Genevieve Collins join me. She is running for Congressional District 32. We used to call it Pete Sessions' seat, but now we just call it it's our seat. It's the seat that belongs to people who live in CD32. So Genevieve Collins, hello. Hi, thank you, Debbie. Thrilled to be here. So glad you could do this. I just want to jump right in and start with, you know, we are, you know, at a phase, we have a one-term Democrat. This guy has been in office less than two years. And so this is a crucial time for people in our district to decide, do we really want to have long-term representation by a Democrat of the people of our district? And so I wanted to start with you, Genevieve Collins. You are going to be our Republican nominee on the ballot in November. Why did? Why are you running? What is this all about for you? Well, for me, the, it's, I could summarize this very briefly. I believe that we need less government in business, but more business in government. And that couldn't be more clear today as we're going through an economic kind of restart. We need people in Congress that understand that they're dealing with the budget and how we get Cong- and how we get America going again. And we need leadership that has uh, that has a background in making sure companies are successful and companies can thrive and people can create an architect of the life they want for themselves, not the government doing it for them. So tell us a little bit about your background, your your work life background before you became a candidate, which uh, so many are cheering you on to have our uh, our seat returned to Republican hands. But tell us a little bit about your background. So I started working at iStation. It's an education technology company. Uh, almost 11 and a half years ago. So I think that makes me like the worst millennial ever because I've only worked for one company. <laughs> my entire- so weird. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's normal that to, you know, the rest of my generation, I might be the odd one out. But I started working at iStation, which is an education technology company that's sole mission is to teach kids how to read and do math to get back on to grade level and close the achievement gap in schools. And so when I started, I actually started in the mail room and about four months later transitioned into inside sales and spent pretty much 10 years of my life working in every capacity in the sales department, working with small uh, panhandle school districts to medium sized suburban to large urban and suburban school districts. So I've actually worked with many government bureaucracies, you know, uh, school districts are their own government bureaucracy for- They certainly are. <laughs> for, they really are for about 11 years. And now I'm head of corporate strategy and I've been in that role for a year and a half, really looking at how are we forecasting the growth of our company? How are we forecasting the products that we need to create three, five years in advance before the market knows what it wants or what it needs? And how are we still meeting the immediate demands and needs of our customers. So that's a little bit of my experience uh, in a nutshell. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn now. Obviously, we can barely have a conversation in America today without talking about the coronavirus, COVID-19, the impact on the economy, and all the various issues. And I don't want to spend our whole interview talking about this, but I do (laughs) want to jump in and just hit a few points because it's really top of mind for most Americans right now. So to start with, there was a bill passed in Congress, a $2.2 trillion with a T, T as in trillion dollar uh, bill that was passed and signed by the president. It was essentially, it was a third in a series of bills that was essentially getting money out to the states to help with the damage done to the economy because of the shutdown of the economy, which was also caused by the government in response to the coronavirus. So just generally in the 2.2 trillion, do you think that Congress, were there pieces of that we shouldn't have in there? Was it too big a bill? Was what, Is Nancy Pelosi out of line in your view to try to be putting in funding for the Kennedy Center and NPR? What is your sense about how we that bill? Well, first off, we have to address that Americans are really struggling. And as Americans, and even as North Texans, we like to work. And we like being productive. And so this coronavirus is a real struggle emotionally for a lot of people, not just physically. So first off, we had to do something. The government had to do something. But adding in excessive amounts of pork and Nancy Pelosi and Colin Allred stalling this bill to get the immediate relief and funding for people in small, medium-sized businesses 
and allowing them to keep their employees on the payroll. I think it's absolutely egregious and atrocious that they stalled the bill by, you know, seven to 10 days and continue to do that. I think it's $2 trillion is a lot of money. And with an already inflated and bloated national debt and deficit, adding this much money and continuing to add more debt and deficit to getting our country back on track, it's something I'm very concerned about. I'll tell you, I thought it was the most, among the most unserious things that I've ever seen in Washington, where the shutdown was caused by government decision and policy, how to deal with coronavirus. You can think it any way you want about that. Yeah. But the damage to the economy came from, from the policies the government put in place. And so the rescue package, to me, should have been laser focused on people hurt by the shutdown. People, as you're describing, small businesses, keeping people in the payroll, keeping alive the potential those, those small businesses can, can come back. That should have been, and helping individuals, individuals who've lost jobs during the shutdown. But I thought it was among the most unserious and honestly kind of uh, telling things that we that we could have done as a as a people that even in the midst of a crisis, we have the left looking for ways to pad things. OK, I'm getting off my soapbox, but to pad things, they always want to pad NPR. I, I mean, I, I, I really oh, so uh, go Kennedy ahead. Center. I mean, the Kennedy Center got twenty five million dollars from this. They have a hundred million dollar endowment start there. And then after they got this money, they laid off the entire symphony. I mean, this is a time for discipline, for fiscal discipline, for we need to be surgical in how we approach getting money to the people that need it immediately. This is not about stuffing in and adding in extra fat. This is about being laser focused. And that just goes to my point that we do not have enough business people in Congress who understand that absolute necessity in terms uh, or in a time where we need complete focus. We have all these people that aren't business people that lack this focus and think that because it's $2 trillion, well, that's a huge dollar. So we should be able to stuff our pet projects in. That is egregious and completely unacceptable. And if I were a Congresswoman, I would absolutely go ballistic on Nancy Pelosi. And I already have on Colin Allred. How incredibly disappointing that he can't stand up for his community, who is an economic engine of not just this state, but our country. Actually, I'd love to have you talk about that. You've used that expression before, and I really do like it. CD32, which for whoever is watching this, if you don't live in Texas, is Heartland Dallas, essentially. It's Heartland Texas, Heartland Dallas. CD32, you've used the expression that we in Texas are the economic engine of the country. What do you mean by that? Well, Texas, Dallas, excuse me, North Texas is a very diverse economy. You know, we've got energy, we've got financial services, we've got tech, you know, we've got big data centers. We've got, a, unlike Houston, which is very dependent on the energy sector, we've actually really diversified what our economy looks like. And we have an incredible amount of innovation happening here among a myriad of sectors, yeah. whether it's education or energy or business and finance. And we're really doing some interesting things and creating a lot of wealth for our state. And I think that if North Texas gets back online faster, the rest of Texas will get back online faster through that, this economic crisis. And an economic crisis it is. I want to turn to a political aspect of this, though, just for a moment to say I have been blown away by how easily so many people, mostly on the left, on the Democrat side, are turning to policies like, and you saw Mayor de Blasio put one of these things out. If you see, telling citizens, if you see people who are not socially distancing, video them, send it in to me so we can go after them and punish them. Right here in Dallas County, our Dallas County judge put out a tweet encouraging people, turn in your neighbors if they're not complying with my regulations. Do you think that's good for a culture or for society? Anytime we're publicly shaming the people that we live next to that are our friends and are our family, that's never an okay thing. We do not live in China for a reason. We don't live in a big brother, <laughs> a big brother state. We have God-given liberties. 
And, you know, this is not the time to, you know, turn in and be nasty towards one another. This is the time for unification. And the fact that folks are on the left are specifically saying, no, go out and, you know, punish these people, shame them. Like, that is not what needs to be happening at all. If they're even awake during this crisis, you know, this is the time for real community. And that's really what I'm trying to convey is that we're here to support each other, both in business and in public health but also as in a family. We have to love one another right now, and that is not the way to go about it. And I am very against a China-driven state. Actually, two things I want to go to. One is, on the, and you alluded to it, but there's so much on the positive good coming out of America's culture and society in Texas and Dallas, all over this country. People who are dealing with this with a sense of, I want to help my neighbor. I, want to, I mean, people who are changing their manufacturing from whatever it is they used to manufacture yeah. into making ventilators or people who are putting little videos up on Facebook. I can teach you how to make a mask. Look what I made, my mask. I mean, yeah. there's so much goodness just spewing out of, of the American people. Just they're, they're bursting with support, encouragement for each other. I love that as a positive quality. Maybe you want to comment on that, but as a positive aspect of this, you're seeing so much love of your neighbor in America. Absolutely. I actually have had a number of college students reach out to my campaign saying, uh, and most of them identify as Democrats. So let me just stay, start there. They've, I, they've come out, they've asked me, like, you know, I remember you said that you graduated in 2008. And after the financial crisis, like, how did you go about getting a job? What are the things that you did? So I did a video wow. about it for these, for these kids and or I put it on social media and it's gone viral to amongst, you know, uh, high school or excuse me, college, college seniors. But, you know, it talks about the American spirit. And to your point, Debbie, what we forget in this time is that the American spirit is innovative, creative, solutions driven and communal. And we are that is who we are. We band together. We come up with thoughtful, interesting solutions. We, re can, we can retool any manufacturing facility like Mary Kay is now making hand sanitizer. Right. Oh, I didn't even know that one. Retool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We can retool a ton of different um, manufacturing compounds into meeting the exact immediate needs of our community. And that's who we are. And what these folks that are saying, shame on you, shame your neighbors for going out, they don't understand the American spirit. And that's why they're not going to be successful in November. I certainly, I believe that, and I certainly hope I'm staying right with you. Okay, so I want to go back to uh, one more thing about the um, package of things that came out of Washington. Part of what Nancy Pelosi was pushing and continues to push is that we need to go to all mail-in ballots, that we are not able in this country to handle the normal voting process in November because we might still have a coronavirus crisis going on. Moving to mail-in ballots, a lot of conservatives say, you know, there is great danger of fraud uh, in mail-in ballots. And so what is your sense about that issue? Well, I, I too, am concerned about the fraud that is associated with mail-in ballots. You can see that in California and how they allow for ballot harvesting, which I think is unconstitutional. But I digress. Uh, but I, it goes back to what we both said. This is a time where we need to be surgical and laser focused on meeting the exact needs of the people, making sure that the most basic needs of folks that are struggling are met. We don't need to be talking about what that looks like in November when people are struggling today. So that's just my point of view that this is, again, extra pork. This is stuffing and this is not helpful in meeting the exact needs of where people are today. Okay, well, we could probably talk the entire time about coronavirus yeah. and all the legislation, but I want to hit some other issues. It's kind of funny, you think in this time, we almost forget what we used to be extremely concerned about a mere eight weeks ago. And all we can think about is the virus. But I do want to turn up one thing. On your website, you mentioned- Tiger King. And Tiger King. The only things that America's talking about are coronavirus and Tiger King. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a story. Okay, so I want to turn on your website. You mentioned about being uh, among the issues you're focused on cybersecurity, and that is a I, I am utterly changing topic. So, uh, but on, on cybersecurity, so many people talk about it. So many are aware of how vulnerable we are, businesses are, individuals are. So, what can Congress do about cybersecurity? Well, I think 
think there's a couple things. First off, you can look at Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon. I think that there's, we need to actually do a good audit to see where are we most vulnerable, um, both in terms of cybersecurity and allowing people or allowing bad actors to infiltrate our systems, but also is there financial waste and duplication? Um, where can we see uh, where our systems are most vulnerable? The electric grid, our water systems, uh, you know, for truckers, something that, you know, could be really affected if we move into an autonomous trunking environment in, in, let's just say, a decade. Well, how can those engines be hacked into and create havoc? Because if we, if trucks stop working, then America stops running, right? And so we need to really think through in a more offensive type of thought structure on how to protect our most basic fundamentals of water, electricity, roads, not just our you know, private bank accounts, um, our, secure, our uh, military secrets. We need to really think through the whole picture. And so I would look at it from a Department of Homeland Security. You can look at it through, uh, you know, like I said, the electric system, but also really where we are with the military. And we need to really identify if there's duplication and waste and that's how I would approach this to begin with. But first, fund some areas where we can really see some big gains, making sure we've got a beefed up security system. I'm so glad you mentioned both the uh, electric grid and water. In this era, when we are focused on, or prior to the virus, we're focused on uh, the threat of China, the threat of um, Islamic extremism, other kinds of threats, external threats, we often envision those as military, or what if they attack us militarily or with off from ships or in some other way attack us physically. But really what China's doing, we've had guests in the show, on, on my show, America Can We Talk, talking about this. Uh, the idea that what China's doing is about 25 steps ahead in terms of endangering America and cybersecurity is a huge huge issue and so glad you mentioned that and it's actually the a little the little plug too for there's a group called center for security policy in washington dc done enormously important work in exposing the threat to the grid helping america understand how all of america could change overnight if we had an attack on the on the electric grid and could not yes. defend it and i don't know if you're familiar with that work at all but absolutely i actually talked with frank gaffney recently so mm -hmm. No, and I think that here's a great example. Huawei was trying to come in and bid for 5G fiber optics and network access. We're now seeing with the coronavirus that you know, rural America still is largely left behind in terms of its broadband capabilities and being accessible. And if Huawei is able to come in and put fiber optics down, who knows what's embedded in that, you know, in those fiber optics? Because it's really easy to attach a tiny chip that can start spying. And I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist here, but this is our reality. And that we have to really think through what are these Chinese companies really trying to do? And how are they circumnavigating our American businesses by underbidding us in contracts, whether that's in rail, like freight rail that Trinity Industries yeah. is constantly fighting against, or in you know fiber optics and internet. These are huge problems that we're going to be facing if we don't uh, make sure that we're holding China accountable. And, and we, have, we have to be the ones that say, we want to be safe first. We want to protect our own identities. We don't want Big Brother. We want to ensure that we're buying American-made um, and American-grade security. Amen to all the above. Okay, you also had on your website, changing topics again, but I know, you know when you're running for Congress or a million things going on, you have to pick some things that seem to either grab you the most or seem the most important to you. You also mentioned border security. Uh, and obviously here in the great state of Texas, we are very conscious of the importance of border security. So what are your thoughts, first of all, about the wall and then more broadly about border security and, and the kind of issues that are kind of steps America could take to make the border more secure? Well, I think the first step that we could take is having Democrats understand that this is a real serious issue and we need them to partner with Republicans on it. You know, yeah. I think having having half of our political for political side um, say that we want open borders, that's not productive to border security. You know? It's the opposite of it's the opposite of. Exactly. Exactly. 
you know, now that we have over 500 miles of wall built, you know, as a businesswoman, I love being able to measure things. So now that we have 500 miles of wall built, we can see its effectiveness in pushing people to specific points of entry. I don't think that a physical structure is cost effective um, or necessary in parts of our, you know, southern border topography that just don't, uh, it, it, where it wouldn't make sense. But we should leverage the use of technology. We should bring in other partners to uh, make sure that we're keeping people on both sides of the border safe. And we should also make sure that, you know, CBP and ICE are actually funded. But I think even more so, we've got to also increase our supply of immigration judges. We only have 465 immigration judges in this in this country. And I think that that's really important as we look to what does immigration really look like. But border security has to have some component of the judicial system put in it. So that way we can turn around folks that are continuously breaking the law. So immigration judges includes people who will take a look at the initial issue when someone crosses the border and says, I'm here because I I'm, I'm, want asylum. I mean, the initial dis determination, do you meet the asylum standards? If we delay those hearings because we don't have enough judges, those people get who knows where they go while they're waiting for right. a hearing. So is that one of the reasons? Is that the... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We want, here's the deal. As it pertains to immigration, we want people to come here. That's not the problem. We just want them to come here legally. We have 7 million job vacancies. We need people to come here. And we want, now that we have to restart our economy, we need high, medium, and low-skilled workers to be a part of basically turning the thrusters back on on our economy. But we need them to come here legally and follow the rule of law, because at the end of the day, if we're a country without law, what are we? Well, we're not a country anymore. As always, the point I say at the end. Okay, so when we're done, we're going to wrap up with this. When we're finally through the coronavirus and we will get through it, what is it you see the GOP, the top things they need to embrace in Washington to get this country back on track? The top things they got to do. Economy, economy, economy. I don't. I mean. The top line is we have to make sure that public health still works, but we've got to give people their livelihoods back. And finding ways to deregulate industries where we can jumpstart innovation, finding ways to audit duplication so that way we can start to cut down some of this enormous debt that we're going that we will take on through this virus. Those are two incredibly important ways and things that we need to do fast that we've got to get people on board with. And I think at the end of the day, this is all going to be how do we basically use our, our know-how as a defibrillator to get the economy going again. And so I think it's all going to be about the economy. And that, my friends, is Genevieve Collins. Uh, I will tell you folks, her website is gcforcongress.com gcforcongress.com. Uh, you can go there and see videos of her and her views on different issues um, and also donate there. Of course, everyone listening understands that, sadly, it just costs money to run for Congress. Campaigns cost money, and I know that you are doing a great job. I want to encourage people, if you can, to donate to support your campaign. And um, any last, yeah, I'll go right ahead. Yeah, I've got two things. First off, um, hopefully most of your viewers saw my mailer that went out that has information on how to get money for PPP or SBA loans. This mailer went out to households of small business owners. I'm hyper-focused on making sure that our community gets the access and the information and the finances that they need to keep going. And secondly, I would, or lastly, I would just say, uh, I have some very exciting news that last week I was identified and nominated as one of the top seven candidates in the country. I'm on the first slate of the National Republican Congressional Committee's Young Guns, mm -hmm. which is a huge honor. It's voted on by members of Congress. And it, it basically shows that this is one of the top seven districts that Republicans are going to, that the party is going to focus on taking back because they've got the right candidate. So really big honor, really exciting, going to have a lot of eyes on Dallas, Texas, and it's going to be a really fun fall. It will be at that. Congratulations. That is a big honor. And I, one thing I meant to plug, I'll just wrap it up with this. 
This is, in 2020, our chance to take back the majority in the U.S. House. And so a lot of people who are driven to get the Republican majority back in place in the U.S. House are looking at races around the country and deciding where could we win who, uh, where are the vulnerable Democrats we can take out? And honestly, to be designated as one of the young guns is a great honor. And it really is a signal that they think you can do this, the National Republican Party. And I'm thrilled about that because I and many people in this county, in this district, CD32, are used to being represented by a Republican who shares their values, which would be you. So, Genevieve Collins, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Debbie. Thank you, PCRW.